uh, spring issue, spring issue of our journal. However, when that journal was that is, that article was published, I was horrified to find that the slides were not in color. And on this particular topic, color makes a big difference. So the slides I'm presenting today are the original color slides and you'll see a lot more on them. Uh, after, uh, and let me kind of now begin the talk. Uh, uh, we humans have a tendency to anthropomorphize, that is to attribute uh, characteristics of humans to other species. And more often than not, that does not work. Uh, I'm guilty myself. Uh, the title of the talk is Sex and the Single Butterfly. And that's a knockoff on the title of Helen Gurley Brown's famous book, Sex and the Single Woman. Uh, or was it single girl? Can't remember. Uh, uh, of course, she used sex in the context of the act, and I'm using sex in the context of gender ID. A uh, couple of examples, and then we'll get to the slides. Uh, when a female butterfly is being courted by a male and she sticks her butt in the air, she's telling the male that she does not want to and indeed probably cannot engage in uh, reproduction. When a human does that, they're sending out quite the opposite signal. <laughs> and finally, we get to uh, uh, perfume. Humans, it's usually the female that wears the perfume. In butterflies, it's invariably the male. The, the pheromones, which are the big sex attracted, attractant, uh, come from the male. And that is an important aspect of determining the sex of uh, butterflies, which we'll get to towards the end of the talk. Uh, with, with that preamble, I'd like to begin with the slides. So if someone could put up the first slide. Hello? Uh-oh. <laughs> I'll know the slide has appeared when I see it. Okay, okay there it is. Uh, uh, there are a number of ways of de determining the sex of a butterfly. That might not matter to much of you, but if you do photography, you want to get a picture of a male and a female. And in many instances, males and females are sexually dimorphic, which is a fancy way of saying they look different. This is a female black swallowtail. And you can see that she has a lot of blue near the base of her hind wing. And the male doesn't. Next slide will show you a male and you'll see what I mean. There, that's the male. He has a lot more yellow and a lot less blue. And if you saw those two either together or separately, uh, most people with some experience with butterflies could instantly tell who the male is and who the female is. Sometimes uh, the differences are a little more subtle. Well, let's move on. The next slide is a Eastern tiger swallowtail. And I don't remember whether I put the male or the female first. There it is. That's a female. And curiously enough, uh, the female also has more blue than the male, although the difference isn't nearly as dramatic as it is in the black swallowtail. That, that's a very well-marked female. Now you can move to the next slide. Mom. I want the next slide. There. Oh no, that's the male. Now this male is an extreme case. Usually the males have a little touch of blue. Uh, but this one has virtually no blue. If, if, if there's a minimal amount of blue or no blue, you can bet the store that it's a male. And that's true of all the 
different tiger swallowtail species that fly in the east. You've got the Canadian, the Eastern uh, tiger, and some people think the Appalachian. They all have this characteristic. Now, sometimes God makes it easier for us to tell the difference, as you'll see in the next slide. Keep advancing the slides. Yeah. Okay. That may not even look like a tiger swallowtail to you. That's a black form tiger swallowtail. And they're always female. And the reason that they're, uh, they sometimes come in a black form is this is mimicking the spice bush swallowtail, which is at the northern limit of its range. So, uh, and it's apparently not tasty for birds to eat. So by mimicking it, uh, she it maximizes the uh, probability that she'll be able to lay her eggs before she gets eaten. Okay. Uh, there aren't many of these in Massachusetts. In fact, I took this picture in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, the further south you go, the more uh, uh, spice bush swallowtails you have and higher the proportion of female eastern tigers uh, that are in this dark form. They do exist in Massachusetts. I've never seen one, uh, uh, but I'd say maybe 1% of the females are in this dark form. Uh, when you see it, you have a tougher time distinguishing between it and the female black swallowtail uh, because there are only hints of the tiger stripes. Uh, but trust me, that's a uh, tiger, tiger swallowtail. Sw One indication of that, which is unfortunately not a reliable field mark, is if you look at where the hind wing and the forewing meet, you'll notice an orange spot. That orange spot. Uh, uh, is, is, is characteristic of actually all the tiger swallowtail species that fly in the east. We have a western tiger swallowtail in, in which that spot is yellow, but uh, since the ranges don't overlap, it's kind of a useless distinction. Uh, so let's move on. Brian, can I ask a question? I can't understand you. Do, do we, uh, I, in 50 years, I've never seen a black tiger swallowtail in Massachusetts. Do we have any confirmed photographs? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Black, I know they've been reported. Uh, tiger swallowtail in Massachusetts. Yeah, they're pretty rare in Massachusetts. In fact, spice bush swallowtail isn't all that. Global warming may fix that. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to get into another area which is makes it usually pretty easy to distinguish. Uh, this is a Hobomox skipper female. Uh, uh, you'll notice she has a, a very fat abdomen. Uh, that comes to a point which, unfortunately, you can barely see in this picture. That's because she's very fresh. You can tell from the purple highlights at the base of the wing. Uh, she's full of eggs. And when she's full of eggs, she has a very plump abdomen that comes to a point. The ovipositor is on the underside. And the pointed abdomen makes it easier for her to place the eggs precisely, which apparently is important. If you look at the male, he's much more yellow. Next, Next slide. slide. Okay, he's much more yellow. And unfortunately, I didn't give you a, 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 a good look at his abdomen, uh, but there's much less brown and much more yellow on the male. If you look at a lot of these, you, you, you learn to tell them apart very easily. Again, the female comes in a dark form. Next slide.
Next slide. Yeah, there's a little lag there. We gotta hear it. Okay. Okay. That is also, believe it or not, a Hobomock skipper. And it's very brown. Uh, when you see one like that, it can only be a female. Now, unlike the eastern tiger, where only about one percent are in the dark form in Massachusetts, the Hobomock, about 30% of the females are in this dark form, which is called form Pocahontas. And when you see one of these, there's no mistake, it's a female. Uh, so let's move to another skipper where uh, the uh, coloration differences are rather subtle. Oh, we, we missed one. Oh, okay. Maybe I uh, got things in the wrong order. Uh, that's a pair of a common checkered skipper. I took this picture at Northampton Community Gardens. When you see them individually, it's kind of hard to tell whether you have a male or a female. When you see them together like this, it's much easier. easier. The, male the male is on, is the, on left, the left and he has a lot more white on him. The female has a lot more brown. Uh, on this particular picture, it also looks like the female is wearing a uh, mink stole, those brown striations. You'd think that would be a very good way to tell them apart. Unfortunately, it's not a reliable field mark. In fact, the only female I ever saw with those brown markings near the head is this one. So let's move ahead probably to the slide I was anticipating. Yeah, that's a Dion skipper. And it's a female, it has a pretty plump abdomen, which comes to a point that you can just see between the petals. Uh, when I was talking about the pointed abdomen to facilitate placing the eggs, this is what I was talking about. The male, has very similar markings. Next slide. Okay, uh, the male is only minimally different, but the shape of the abdomen is completely different. The abdomen on the male Dion skipper is straight and ends in a bunch of hairs. It's not at all pointed. Once you get used to looking at male and female Dion skippers, you'll pick that up right away. And that's really the best way to determine whether you have a male or a female. Okay, moving right along. Okay, now this is a uh, copper, uh, what copper is it? Uh, the one that uses cranberries, bog copper. That's a female and look how plump and, and pointed the abdomen is. This is a fresh female and she's absolutely full of eggs. Also notice she has a lot of spots on all four wings. The male doesn't. Uh, this didn't show up well in the article because it doesn't look so dramatic in black and white. Next slide has the female and you'll see the differences right away. Man. Okay, there it is. Female has very much fewer black spots on all the wings. It has a, a straight, relatively straight abdomen, and it has purple highlights when the light angle is right, uh, which the female never has. This didn't show up at all in the article because the, the slides were printed in black and white. But when you're uh, determining the difference between male and female, uh, bog coppers is a slam dunk. You, 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 you can't go wrong. It's easy to see in the color, the color slides. slides. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to sexual chemistry, which is an interesting topic. And it's uh, 
our friend the monarch is our, our first example. Uh, this is a female monarch. Uh, her abdomen isn't so plump, but you'll notice that the, the black on the veins of the females are fairly thick. And also the last vein on the hind wing before the body does not have uh, uh, the uh, uh, cells which emit the pheromones, which are very prominent as black spots on the male, who is in the next slide. Yeah, there's the male. You'll notice those uh, how how much thinner the the black linings on the veins are throughout the body. And you'll also notice those little elongated black spots on the last vein next to the body on the hind wing. Those are the uh, cells that emit the pheromones to put the female in the right mood. The males have them and the females don't. Uh, the, the monarch is the only one I know of that has this kind of sex spots, uh, scent spots, I think they're called because they're female detects them. Uh, of course, butterflies smell through their feet, so I'm not quite sure how that works. Uh, so now let's move along again. Next slide. Skippers are always, always fun. fun. The next, next two sets, two sets of slides, slides will be skippers, and then we'll be done. Okay. Uh, that's a female tawny edged skipper. You'll notice it's, it's pretty brown. It just has uh, uh, the orange color right along the edge, uh, leading edge of the forewing. That's why it's called a tawny edged skipper. The male has scent spots in the form of a stigma on the forewing, which you cannot miss. It jumps out and bites you. So. Let's look at the next slide. You'll see what I mean. There, that dark black area, that's called a stigma. And a lot of skippers have it. In some of them, of which this is one example, uh, I think Zabulon also has a very prominent one. It jumps out and bites you. It's a very saturated black. And then that, that, those, that contains the cells that emit the pheromones. Uh, and on many, many skippers, it's easily visible and easy to distinguish the males and the females. However, that's not always so naturally. The next slide is a European skipper. I think we start with the female and we move to the male. That's the female. Look at the forewing. It has veins, but there are no elongated or fat or dark areas. The male does have stigma, but unless you really stare at it, they're very hard to see. When it comes to ID, skippers are really a pain in the neck. There, see that very faint thickening of the vein uh, on the forewing? That's the stigma on a European skipper. They're looking at this as a male, you can see it has a straight abdomen with a hairy back to it. So that's a secondary way to confirm that uh, you've got a, uh, a, a male. Now we're going to get to the get last, last pair of slides. slides. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll be seeing a, a, a female sleepy dusky wing, which was probably photographed at Miles Standish. Okay. That's a female. Now, and it's clearly a sleepy dusky wing. That's the only one with field marks like that. Uh, if you look at the, the, the costa, which is to say the leading edge of the forewing, you'll notice that on this butterfly, it looks dead straight. 
That's because it does not have a costal fold because the females don't emit pheromones. On the male, next slide. And mercifully, the last slide. <laughs> there it is. Uh, this is really, really hard to see in the field. And it's not always easy to see on a photo, but the part of the forewing closest to the body is folded over. And the scent cells that the, this male uses to um, uh, uh, emit pheromones is underneath that fold. Uh, you can see it best on the right hand forewing. If you look at it, it's not that straight where the, where, where the uh, wing is folded over. You can see a discontinuity. It looks like a bend in the wing. And if you're lucky, you'll see that you'll be able to distinguish uh, between male and female. But in reality, like with all skippers, ID is really tough. Uh, in fact, this is one of the few photos where I can see that fold clearly. Uh, several other dusky wings exhibit uh, the same costal fold. Not all dusky wings that fly in Massachusetts, but I'd say about two thirds have a costal fold. And that's probably the best way to determine the sex on, on those species. So that's basically it. Uh, I wish I, identifying butterflies uh, or determining the sex of butterflies was uh, an exact science. Unfortunately, it isn't. The only sure way to determine the sex of a butterfly is to catch it, kill it, and look at it under a microscope and dissect the genitalia. Uh, as it happens, we don't believe in that in NABA. And as it also happens, collectors don't believe in that because if you dissect a butterfly, it's no longer suitable for collecting. Uh, so we just have to make do with the methods that we have. And just because we don't have it as an exact science doesn't make it less interesting. To me, it even makes it more interesting. So with, with, with that conclusion, uh, uh, I think you can unmute all the microphones and I'll handle, I'll try to handle any questions. If anyone wants a copy of the color slides, I can uh, I can probably uh, email it. Just let me know. Send me an email. Everyone's muted, so if there are questions, I won't be hearing them. Thanks, Frank. Okay, uh, I hope you learned something. I did. Good. Interesting. Yes, thank you very much, Frank. That was very, very interesting. Okay, my pleasure. If there are no questions, uh, it's 4.30 here, so I can get ready for a pre-dinner snack. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. So thanks very much. I'm glad I had a chance to present this talk in semi-in person. <laughs>